Hello there, live from the attic. You're watching JW Watch, the show that keeps a close eye on all things JW, offering Jehovah's Witnesses a more objective viewpoint on current developments that the governing body almost certainly doesn't want them to hear. Now, this is going to be an interesting live stream uh, for me to do because basically I have been sitting on a piece of information for over four years along with some other activists and recent developments have caused me to reflect on why exactly it's being kept from the public and whether the public should know about it and I realize I'm anticipating <laughs> in light of all of the abuse I've put up with over the last year and a half I'm anticipating you know what people are going to be saying and I can just hear people say or the haters say he's deflecting He's trying to shift attention away from himself onto another subject, onto someone else. And, you know, you can think that if you want. When it comes to, you know, the hatred that's been directed at me, and I've just recently been exposed to a huge sampling of it when I was making the most recent upload, um... I just don't care anymore, to be honest, what clearly damaged individuals who, who fixate over me. Uh, I just don't, don't care what they think. I, I know the reasons why I am sharing this information now. There are two main reasons. First of all, um, as you will know if you watched my last video, the Lloyd Evans scandal, The Aftermath, You'll know that I'm now working by myself. I'm no longer working with Tibor, my video editor. We have parted ways by mutual agreement. I am closing my production company. That's going to wrap up in two or three weeks. Once everything's settled in terms of taxes and what have you. Um... And for a long period, I guess I was pursuing this sort of strategy of, number one, kind of trying to shield my my company, protect my company, and uh, be mindful of the fact that it, it wasn't just me talking. I had, like, people working with me, and I, I had to think about the effect of, of what I said on them and... Um, and that sort of thing. But I I was also mindful about, you know, not whipping up drama by mentioning people by name that I've worked with previously. I, I pursued a strategy for a long time of uh, just ignoring the haters, you know, only, only referencing them occasionally um, in hopes that, you know, my work would just speak for itself, uh, which I think largely it did. But with when it comes to Jehovah's Witness activism or ex-Jehovah's Witness activism, um, you know, the truth is that credibility is a big issue. And if there are any question marks over someone's credibility, you know, real or imagined, e even if it's just totally made up nonsense, it really impacts on your ability to reach people, especially people who are coming out of a toxic group that treats, quote-unquote, apostates with suspicion. 
So I have been pursuing this strategy for quite some time of uh, stirring up as little drama as possible and, and not mentioning by name um, people who I've worked with in the past who, who are no longer working with me. So that's, I guess, a big reason why it's taken until now. When I know now, when I have no longer anything to lose, I know I'm no longer fearful of losing my company because that's gone or will be gone shortly. Um, I'm no longer particularly bothered about um, upsetting people by mentioning them because I actually don't intend to really say anything negative about about the people. To, to, to be honest. Um, so that's like a main reason why I've stayed silent this long. Um, and that's the reason why I'm talking about it now. And another main reason why I'm talking about it now is because I recently have been watching a brilliant documentary, which is on Disney Plus, called The Secrets of Hillsong. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's absolutely incredible, and the parallels with Jehovah's Witnesses are astonishing. But there was one episode in particular, uh, episode three, Sins, The Sins of the Father. So this is a, a documentary that, that's been directed and produced by Stacey Lee about the Hillsong Church. And in episode three, the sins of the father it talks about how the current leader of the hillsong church essentially covered up the abuse that was perpetrated against multiple children by his father so we're talking about frank houston who was once a leader of the Assemblies of God. He started doing his preaching in New Zealand and he moved things over to Australia. And Brian Houston sort of succeeded him and Brian Houston is now leader of what's called the Hillsong Movement or Church, whatever, however you want to call it. And I found it really very very unsettling to see a very clear example of a leader of a religious movement having their abuse covered up <clears throat> and this abuse only being only being brought to light by the diligent efforts of individuals and and maybe these individuals only had like one piece of the jigsaw puzzle but by talking to other individuals they were able to put pieces of the jigsaw together and all of a sudden it's like oh good grief what happened here is mind-blowing how could this individual have gotten away with this and what also um, connected a few dots in my mind was the fact that it referenced the Australian Royal Commission because the Hillsong Church was part of the investigation by the Australian Royal Commission, which, of course, I did an investigation into Jehovah's Witnesses. So hearing the Australian Royal Commission mentioned and hearing about this monster, Frank Houston, who had his crimes covered up by the church that his son ended up leading, there were these kind of lines connecting, you know, dots being connected in my mind. And I thought, there's some information I need to share. I, I, there's some information that I need to... If, if I don't make it public, I need to at least know that someone else is making it public. And I, I certainly don't want to take this knowledge to my grave I, I don't want a situation where I don't talk about it and something ends up happening to me and the other 
ex-Jehovah's Witness activists who know about it because they haven't spoken about it publicly. Something ends up happening to them. And before you know it, an, an opportunity to, again, put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together is lost. And when I, when I talk about pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, the information I'm about to share with you is obviously about Ted Jarrett, Theodore Jarrett. And what I have to share with you is not conclusive. And, and that's another main reason why I haven't spoken about this on the channel before is because I've tried to keep everything I talk about on the channel absolutely, you know, verifiable. You know, so so this happened and here's how we prove it and, and here's the person talking about how this is the teaching and, you know, everything is easily verifiable. I, I don't think... Broadly speaking, we need to go beyond that when it comes to ex-Jehovah's Witness activism. And in fact, I think we stand to lose a great deal when we do stray beyond the the burden of proof, when, when we, we stray into uh, speculation and supposition. So, but that's what I have to share with you isn't speculation and supposition um you might call it hearsay um i'm i'm basing what i know upon what i was told um but i can name the names of of the people who told me this and i feel there is a piece of the jigsaw and i don't need to be the one who finishes the jigsaw i, I just need to put my piece of the jigsaw on the table and that's what this video is is aiming to do i think that's everything i need to say uh by way of um disclaimers um welcome to the 188 who are currently watching and uh thank you to lisa burberry for your very kind super chat i i I will keep up the good work, Lloyd. Remember, we honestly love you and support you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I'm going to try as much as possible to keep on top of the uh, comments. There's Lisa's. Um, not just the Super Chats, obviously. Uh, but bear in mind that I this is an important subject and I am mindful of the fact that I'm dealing with a multi-billion dollar organization and I need to be very precise with what I'm saying. Uh, I'm very careful with how I put things and and therefore I want to focus on the information that I have, I have to share with you. So Theodore Jarrett, who is he? Well, he is or was a governing body member he was born September 28, 1925, in Pike County, Kentucky. In late 1974, so Ray Franz era, he was invited to the governing body, meaning that he was one of the governing body members involved in the purge of apostates described by Ray Franz. He was one of the ones who did the deed. Um, and I think he... I think he was even mentioned in Crisis of Conscience, if I'm not mistaken. He died on June 9th, 2010, at the age of 84. And his obituary appears in the Watchtower of 2010, November 15th, page 23. And rather chillingly, the title of the obituary is The Things He Did Have Gone Right With Him. The things he did have gone right with him. Okay. Uh, well, I, I would argue that based on what I know to be true, uh, that's debatable. So let's, before I really get stuck into this, let's um, look at 
some video footage of Ted Jarrett, uh, just so you all know who I'm talking about. Oh, archives, we have comments from Brother Theodore Jarrett, who served as a member of the governing body before he died and received his heavenly reward. Young ones, this illustrates that weathering test of faith as a young person can mold us for a long life of faithful service. If we take our stand firmly on Jehovah's side and uh, support uh, that side, then uh, we're going to succeed in accomplishing uh, what he wants us to do. He's backing us up. And as Jesus promised, he would be with us down to the conclusion of the system of things. We experience that. As the prophet Zechariah wrote, it's not by human might or power, but by my spirit. It would be impossible for humans to do what Jehovah accomplished. We have to give him full credit for the things that have transpired. And it's a marvel in our eyes when we look back to see how he did it. We were simply instruments in his hand. And he maneuvered us and guided us by his spirit and we tried to be uh, responsive to the way that spirit led us. So that was the late uh, Theodore Jarrett talking on JW Broadcasting. Um, you know, and I think I think that clip establishes that he is honoured or he is uh, acknowledged, shall we say, uh, by the existing governing body as um, a past member who had a faithful record of service. So it's not like other members of the governing body, such as recent example Tony Morris, who were removed while they were still alive. And there are examples such as Leo Greenlee's um, going back to the uh, 1970s and 1980s, uh, you know, where governing body members were kind of moved out and uh, basically fired. And there was some ambiguity as, as to their as to their character. That's not the case with Ted Jarrett, at least from the point of view of, of the organization. He, um, as far as they're concerned, had a faithful record of service. And as as his obituary says, um, or the title says, again, the things he did have gone right with him. So he is, or, or he, he was, sorry, a part of the faithful and discreet slave. He, he was part of Jehovah's organization and died a part of Jehovah's organization, a, a member of the faithful and discreet slave. And as, as far as Jehovah's Witness literature is, con, uh, is concerned, he has received his heavenly reward. He is, he is ruling right now in heaven with Jesus and influencing what's happening on the earth today. So... That's who he is, and his name is attached to pedophilia anyway because of the documentary, the, the BBC Panorama documentary in 2000, which aired in 2002, when there was astonishing footage of him being quizzed by Betsan Powies, a BBC reporter, actually at a convention about child abuse. And it was astonishing footage. And what's interesting is I was putting together the information for or the you know the, the this video material to, to kind of show you in this live stream. And there are two versions of Suffer the Little Children that I could find on YouTube. Both of them terrible resolution. The first one with, I think, Spanish subtitles ended after 12 or 13 minutes. So it didn't have the Theodore Girat's footage. And the other one with uh, Greek subtitles, um, weirdly, had 
the most interesting part, the, the part where Ted Gerratz is being quizzed, removed. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, well, how, how is that part missing? Um, so that was weird. And the only past version of the video, maybe I needed to do more digging. I, don't, I mean, I was doing it rather hastily just in the build-up to this live stream. The only video that I could immediately find to hand was the following uh, clip from that BBC Pan Panorama documentary. And again, it's not just terrible resolution, but this particular version rather irritatingly has writing all over it by whoever uploaded it to YouTube. So apologies about the writing, not mine. Apologies about the resolution. Again, we're talking about a 2002 documentary. Maybe one day um, there can be some high resolution, uh, a high resolution version made available of this particular encounter. But I'll show you what I have. So just back to America and back to a Jehovah's Witness convention in Tulsa. We'd been told we'd find a member of the governing body here. Ted Gerrits is one of the men responsible for the church's child protection policy. For more than two months, we've been asking them for an interview. We want answers to some simple questions. Why do they keep their database of suspected paedophile secret? Why don't they report all allegations of abuse to the police? Why do they send children back to the arms of their abusers? They refuse to talk to us, but here at last, we had our chance. How do you justify keeping a list of people, men in some cases, who have confessed to paedophilia, but you have not reported them to the authorities? What justification is there for you, you know, to keep that list? You have a privacy law. You have a directive from the European Union. You observe that, don't you? So when allegations well, of abuse are made, it's all right to keep them private? I think you were answered. That question was answered to your can you answer it now? I'm not going to repeat. I'll just tell you exactly that you can go and you see it in writing. It's all the same. You know, the Bible says, do not go beyond the things that are written. We don't go beyond the things that are written. And that was that. No doubt, no second thoughts. Just a simple belief that Jehovah will sort it out. Okay, so I should just correct what I said earlier. Uh, the the writing is a bit distracting, but it's at least telling us what he's saying, and uh, the audio, to be fair, is is pretty horrendous. So, um, I guess kudos to whoever put this on YouTube with the writing, because at least it's showing us uh, more clearly what uh, Ted Jarrett was saying, and he is being confronted as early as 2002 about the cover-up of abuse by Jehovah's Witnesses, the the database, and he is evading the question. I think we can objectively say that. So that's sort of why when you, I guess, Google his name, um, pedophilia is, is attached to his name anyway because of that encounter and incidentally uh, following the BBC Panorama documentary um, there's a, there was actually an, an email sent to Betsam Powies uh, a lengthy uh, no, was it an email or a fax I think it was a fax <laughs> back, back in the days of faxes um, a fax was sent in which they basically admitted that there was that, that they kept records that they had a database but they said something along the lines of it's not the number that you gave or it's it's not as many as as you think so um yeah that's that's who we're talking about theodore jarrett and i am keeping a, a a bit of an eye on on the comments and there's one interesting one that's come through thanks by the way to uh, gail smith for your super chat um, Tamar Janes, hi Tamar, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, Tamar says, there have been many rumours about him, 
Barbara Anderson said he was angry about the awake on child abuse being in 80s. Also, he was rumoured to be moved from the Australian Bethel because of sexual abuse. So, yes, there were, there have been rumours circulated about, again, a an individual who died a member of the faithful and discreet slave in good standing. There have been rumours that he was moved from Australia because of sexual abuse. Rumours. So, hopefully that contextualizes everything. Uh, hopefully we're all clear on who Ted Jarrett's is. We're, we understand why he was already linked with pedophilia. Quite apart from the rumours, he evaded a question on the accumulating of um, criminal information by Jehovah's Witnesses. So now I need to share this information that I've been sitting on. 2019, I go to Australia with Javier Ortiz and Juan Escapedo, uh, two colleagues at the time with whom I was making a documentary called The Truth About the Truth. We also met up in Sydney with Mark O'Donnell, who was another colleague of mine. While we were... Sorry, I, sh I, I just want to make everything clear. I don't want to forget anything. So while we were in Australia, um, we obviously did a lot of filming and a lot of things were organised. And this is to give credit. I'm not um, naming and shaming here. This is to give credit where credit's due, okay? So a lot of the um, filming and interviews and events that uh, we were involved in in Australia were arranged by Sherry and Sasha D'Souza, who are also former uh, colleagues of mine. Um, I would say Sherry in particular uh, was did a fantastic job in arranging, helping to arrange a series of interviews. And in terms of my work while we were out there, I, I did actually make a video about, I think it, it was called TTATT, The Truth About the Truth, Down Under, and I shared some footage from that period. And in terms of my work, um, I was obviously there to conduct interviews. So the interviews that I conducted were with Sasha and Sherry D'Souza, with Kim Silvio, with Paul Grundy, with Angus Stewart. That was an amazing uh, privilege. Maybe I'm forgetting someone else. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> um, that's it. I, I think that's. I think those were all the interviews I conducted, unless I'm unless my memory's unclear. Um, but there was one interview, in particular, that I didn't conduct, and the reason why I didn't conduct it was because it was getting towards the end of the trip in Australia and we'd had a very busy schedule and I wanted some time to go to Sydney Zoo with my family and so I left I left it to Javier Ortiz and Juan Escapedo and Mark O'Donnell to conduct uh, I think it might have been the final interview of our trip I'm pretty sure it was the final interview of our trip and it was with an individual named James Pender. 
So I'm just, I, I don't want to dox James Pender in any way, uh, but he is on LinkedIn. Um, he's currently the managing coronial advocate at the Aboriginal Legal Service of New South Wales. And if, if you go on James Pender's, spelt P-E-N-D-E-R, if you go on James Pender's um, LinkedIn profile, you'll find that for the period November 2014 to December 2017, uh, three years, two months, he was principal legal officer to the Royal Commission into institu Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. So he was heavily involved in the Australian Royal Commission. In fact, not just involved, he was, he was part of, essentially, the Australian Royal Commission. I'm just going to briefly read what it says in his uh, bio. Delivered complex public hearings, managing all aspects from investigation through to hearings, submissions and report writing into allegations of child sexual abuse within the Yoga Ashram at Mangrove Mountain, the Jehovah's Witness Church, the Australian Defence Force, Immigration Detention Centres, the Criminal Justice System, the Pentecostal Church and the Uniting Church. So it's it's on his... I'm I'm not making it up that he was involved. It's on his um, LinkedIn profile that he was part of the Australian Royal Commission. Just quickly glancing at comments and getting my head in order. So again, I didn't attend that interview. Um, I did catch up with um, Javier Ortiz and Juan Escapero and um, Mark O'Donnell uh, in the evening after the interview. I think it might have been the final evening that we were in Australia. Um, and it was fascinating because it turned out that this interview with with James Pender, which I just assumed was, you know, it was helpful for, for what we were doing. We were making a film about, um, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and abuse, and here's, here's someone who was involved in the Australian Royal Commission. I, I didn't know that, that that interview would end up being the biggest bombshell of, not just the filming in Australia, but our entire our entire um, investigation in making the truth about the truth documentary. So I meet up with Javier Ortiz and Mark O'Donnell and everyone else. Uh, it's Sydney Harbour Front. It's uh, I think one of the restaurants on on Sydney Harbour Front, and. Javier and I break off from the group to go to Starbucks because we wanted to buy, well, I, I, we wanted coffee, but I think we also wanted to see whether they had any, um, any mugs because Javier used to have this tradition of, of buying a, a Starbucks mug to take back home whenever we were um, away filming. And so Javier and I, Go on this conversation. Go on this um, walk by ourselves, and Javier is clearly excited about what's happened in this interview with with James Pender, and what he shares with me is that during the interview, sorry, following the interview, um, James Pender was asked a question by Mark O'Donnell and the answer was incredible. Um, let's 
it's, sorry, it's, it's surprisingly difficult to do this. <laughs> it's surprisingly difficult to do this. And I've, I've been sitting on this for so long and now it's finally coming out. Um, I can kind of realize why it was so difficult to hold on to this for so long. So the interview is basically at an end. And I, I'm conveying this as it was described to me by Javier Ortiz. So full disclosure, I wasn't there. I'm I'm telling you how it was described to me by Javier Ortiz. And Javier Ortiz is obviously someone who you can consult yourselves. Again, I'm putting the jigsaw piece on the table. Uh, the interview was over and the, the cameras had stopped rolling and Mark O'Donnell asked James Pender whether out of the 1006 records of pedophiles that were subpoenaed by the Australian Royal Commission, whether there were any big names, whether there were any high-profile um, Jehovah's Witness individuals in those names. And to this question, James Pender apparently answered yes. And then Mark O'Donnell asked the question, was it a governing bo was the individual a governing body member? To which James Pender apparently answered yes. And then Mark O'Donnell answered uh, asked the question, um, was the individual Th Theodore Gerrards, to which James Pender answered yes. So during his time working on the Austra Australian Royal Commission, the investigators, including James Pender, looking through the records that were subpoenaed, because, you know, you can look at the spreadsheet but all of the personal information is re is redacted regarding who the individuals were but apparently one of the 1006 uh, names that came up was that of Theodore Giratz and that came up in the records that was subpoenaed from Watchtower and according to what I was told the reason why it couldn't be included, or one of the reasons, I should say, why it wasn't included in the information that came out in the ARC was because the alleged victim either couldn't be contacted or had died. If it, if it could have been that the victim were alive or were cooperative, then then perhaps they would have included um, th this information in the Australian Royal Commission. But as it happened, that they couldn't apparently f for this reason, amongst whatever uh, reasons. So Javi tells me this, and my jaw is just on the floor, and... I'm like, wow, that's the reason. That's the reason these bastards have been doing this all along, have been covering up information, because the trail leads all the way to the top. And if Jehovah's Witnesses knew that a governing body member who died in, in good standing who died as a member of the faithful and discreet slave, who was chosen by Jehovah to be one of the faithful and discreet slave, if they knew that he was an alleged pedophile, it basically torpedoes the entire religion, doesn't it? Because whether the allegations prove to be true or not. How could Jehovah choose somebody who is an alleged pedophile, someone who, who has 
there's an actual name and someone has reported this individual, how could Jehovah choose someone like that or someone with that track record to be part of his mouthpiece on the earth? And from that point, the conversation went something like this. Oh, good grief, we've, we've got to tell people about this. Um, maybe I should make a video now. And then it was, I can't remember whether it was Javi or me, uh, but, you know, one of us said, of course, we can't because all we have is breadcrumbs. We, you know, we don't have the document. Um, how, how can we prove this? I think that this can be proven. I think that what's stopping it from being proven is the fact that nobody knows about it. And I think that if uh, if a properly funded news organisation and, quite frankly, a good investigative journalist was a guess on this, it would very, very quickly all be proven. Because James Pender uh, confirmed it at least according to what I was told by Javier Ortiz and Mark O'Donnell when I was working with them. And apparently somewhere there is a, a document with Ted Jarrett's name on it and attached to um, an accusation of, of a criminal kind. Now, sorry, I'm trying to get all my thoughts in order and be... <laughs> Very precise. And again, this is turning out to be harder than I expected. Now, James Pander, uh, first of all, um, I should mention that the cameras apparently weren't rolling when James Pender said this. However, I do know that Mark O'Donnell uh, at least claimed after the fact Mark O'Donnell at least claimed to have audio of James Pender saying all this. So this is a conversation that has apparently been recorded. And if I know Mark O'Donnell, he, he's still got the recording because Mark O'Donnell keeps everything. <laughs> um, so it's, a, it's more than simply hearsay because we have an individual who worked on the Australian Royal Commission giving a piece of information that was recorded. I don't know whether it was, I don't know whether he knew it was being recorded, but Mark O'Donnell got the audio. He might have shared it with Javi. I'm a little bit unclear as to whether Javi has the audio, but I know that Mark O'Donnell at least had the audio of. James Pender naming Ted Jarrett as an individual who was one of the 1,006 pedophiles that were on the uh, in the names in in the records recovered by the Australian Royal Commission. James Pender was since approached by Sky News because back in hang on let me quickly get my dates right. Back in 2021, I was assisting Sky News with an investigative piece that they put out on child sexual abuse in the wake of the ICSA inquiry, or at least the Jehovah's Witness component of the ICSA inquiry. And I was corresponding with, and again, I can give names, I was corresponding with a specialist producer named Liz Liz Lane. Kind of ironic, you think, Lois Lane. I promise you I'm not making up that name. It was Liz Lane, and Liz Lane, last I checked, is on uh, X or Twitter. So Liz Lane, specialist producer. And I let Liz Lane know about this because I, I figured... Even by that point, I was starting to get very disenchanted or very disillusioned with how slowly the Truth About the Truth documentary was, was coming along. Um, 
I was starting to doubt whether it would even happen. And and this is this was coming from someone who had devoted a lot of time uh, and effort uh, and energy to uh, traveling around and interviewing people and uh, assisting with the production. And, and I was starting to doubt whether the documentary would even be made. And so I thought, hang on, Sky News is doing this piece on Jehovah's Witnesses. They have the resources to question James Pender about this. And maybe maybe the truth can come to light about what happened. And so I'm going to read to you now from an email that was sent to me by Liz Lane at Sky News, dated 27th of September 2021. By the way, I did eventually speak to James Pender but he didn't reveal about Ted Jarrett's. I didn't ask him, ask about him specifically about Jarrett's, as I didn't want to reveal that you had told me, but did ask directly whether any senior JW figures were named in the files, and he said no. So I don't think I will get very far with that for now, not least because we are commencing quite a big investigation on another story. Plus, when it comes to JW, our boss wants us to focus on more UK stroke Ireland angles. But let's stay in touch. So, I mean, I could, I guess I could show, show you the email to show that I'm not lying, but anyone, anyone can create an email as I've you know, discovered or have first-hand experience of. Um, but the point is, I'm, I'm not just saying there is this email. I, I'm naming the person who sent me the email. I'm giving you the date when the email was sent. So it's on the systems of, of Sky News. And I have obviously, based on this email, reached the conclusion that for whatever reason, uh, James Pender doesn't want to talk about Ted Jarrett's. So that what he said to Mark O'Donnell and uh, and the Truth About the Truth documentary team when we were in uh, Australia in 2019, again, I wasn't in the room at the time, um, he, for whatever reason, is distancing himself from that. Now, to be clear, um, I'm not trying to throw shade on James Pender. I don't know what reasons he has. I don't. I don't even know, to be completely honest with you, whether what I've been told in this email is true. It could be just um, fobbing me off, or may maybe James Pender was never even asked. I, I, I don't. I have no way of knowing. But I have strong reason to believe that James Pender um, has distanced himself from what he said to Mark O'Donnell, which again, to my knowledge, was actually recorded, at least in audio form, even if it wasn't filmed. So that's what I know. I, I know that some information came to light while we were in Australia in 2019. I think, it again, credit to um, Sherry D'Souza, who I'm no longer working with or on friendly terms with, credit to Sherry D'Souza for organising, to my knowledge, that interview. Credit to Mark O'Donnell, who I'm no longer on friendly terms with and no longer working with, for asking those questions. Um, but that happened. That happened. And I've been sitting on this information for over four years, and I'm, I'm not sitting on it anymore. I, again, I'm not taking that stuff to my grave. Now, what we did do following this, when we came back from Australia and we were kind of regrouping, is we formed a WhatsApp group with 
it was myself and Javi and Mark and Kim Silvio. And Kim Silvio uh, apparently, pers- I'm, again, I'm trying to choose my words very carefully, um, uh, apparently pursued a f- an FOI, a Freedom of Information uh, request for the documents about Theodore Jarrett that were seen by the Australian Royal Commission. And when reporting back to us, um, it seemed that she was unsuccessful. Uh, It seemed that the Australian Royal Commission was sending back just anything, just, just general stuff that was already common knowledge or that had nothing to do specifically with Ted Jarrett's. Um, I obviously now have very, very strong reasons to to distrust Kim Silvio because she's told countless lies about me. So I don't even know for sure um, whether the information that was being passed back to us, whether I can um, be certain that the FOI request even happened. Um, but let's give the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume that that there was an FOI request. Um, the ARC apparently didn't cooperate and didn't deliver the documents. So what what we're dealing with here is the Australian Royal Commission apparently not divulging this information uh, when given an FOI request, which I have to assume was in fact lodged. We have an investigator, uh, sorry, let me be absolutely precise. We have a principal legal officer uh, from the Australian Royal Commission who uh, has, to my knowledge, distanced himself from what was said. And to my shame, we have ex-Jehovah's Witness activists, myself included, uh, not sharing what we know, for whatever reason. Again, it it turns out, as I'm making this live stream, that it's actually harder to talk about this now that I'm actually doing it than than I expected it to be. Um, I'm, I'm not proud. I'm not proud that I sat on this information for so long. But I know what I was told, and and I trust, you know, regardless of everything that's happened between Javier Ortiz and me and Mark O'Donnell and me, I trust what I, I trust them in in what I was told at that time. And uh, to be clear, obviously, there's, there's a lot of bad blood between myself and Javier Ortiz. I was thrown off the truth about the truth documentary in the early days of the hate campaign, um, which was very, very upsetting for me. And what's even more upsetting about that whole thing is that I don't believe that the film will actually ever be made now. That's just... I hope I'm proven wrong. But if you go on the Truth About the Truth Facebook page... The, the the last update from them is the announcement about them getting rid of me. That's that's the last thing. And that was, what, a, a year and a half ago or more? Um, and I was already feeling disillusioned at that point that um, it was taking so long. And then they get rid of, out of the three of us, me, Juan and Javi, they get rid of the only... Uh, producer who actually had experience with documentaries because neither Javi nor Juan uh, were up to that point documentary filmmakers. Um, So I I, I just had this horrible feeling when they got rid of me, apart from feeling incredibly um, upset by kind of being thrown under the bus so quickly. um, 
I just had this horrible feeling that the film's just not going to be made now. The film's not going to be made and all to satisfy uh, a hate mob. So there's, there's bad blood between me and Javi. There's bad blood between me and Mark. Um, but you know what? Both of those guys, um, there's nothing... There's nothing that they have said or done that I can't look past for the sake of the cause. There's nothing that they've said or done. And they've said and done an awful lot, but there's nothing that they've said or done where it's like where I can think, you know what, this dude's a, a bad person. I, I think that they're they're good people. I can't say the same about Kim Silvio, but definitely as regards Javi and and Mark O'Donnell, um, they're good people. That they're, they're I, I'm upset with stuff that they've said and done, but they they I'm sure they're gonna they would say the same thing about me, and and I accept I accept that when the hate campaign was in its certainly in its early days, they were put in a very, very difficult situation. And if I try to put myself in their shoes, being honest, it's like, God, God, you know, you <laughs> sometimes you just want di- to put as much distance between you and a bomb that's going off <laughs> as possible. So I, I can kind of weirdly understand the way they reacted. So just to be absolutely clear, I am not singling out for any criticism in this video Javier Ortiz or Mark O'Donnell. I think they're great people. They, there you go. I think they're great people. Um, I don't expect to be working with them again, uh, but I... And, and there's a lot that's happened that I feel upset about, but they're basically good people. Um, but I'm naming names in this video, including their names, because this is information that I, I again, refuse to take to my grave. I'm, I'm, I want to just put this out there. And it's not like I'm trying to create an opportunity for myself. I, I don't want to be the one who who puts the pieces of the jigsaw together. I my my capacity for, for for even thinking about doing that has long dissipated. I I I just want to <laughs> survive at, at this stage, and as I said in my last video, just go down to making a, a small number of, of of videos for the channel moving forward, including uh, you know the occasional live stream. Um, but I, I have to share what I know because four years and counting is too long. And I understand that this isn't concrete. I understand that this is, you know, to a large extent hearsay. And I have set my face against that sort of, shall we say, uh, ex Jehovah's Witness journalism for my entire career. But it was, again, watching the Hillsong documentary in particular that made me think, this is a piece of the jigsaw. It, it just is. And something needs to be done about this. There, there are actual names. There is somewhere with Mark O'Donnell, uh, there is a recording. There is somewhere gathering dust in an office somewhere in Australia, a piece of paper with Ted Jarrett's name on it, I believe. I believe. Um, and to be absolutely clear, for legal reasons, um, I cannot say that Ted Jarrett's is a pedophile because these are allegations. The whole point of, of the 1006 figure and the findings of the Australian Royal Commission is that allegations were not passed to the police. Um, but I worry 
that there's a bit of a cover-up going on, that I have sort of been a bit complicit in for at least the last four years. And I feel that, I, I feel it in my bones that at, at the core of this is the entire reason why Jehovah's Witnesses keep secret records of child abuse. It's because, again, the trail of breadcrumbs goes to the very top. Because if they were to be fully open with the authorities about their records, it would be devastating to them, not just reputationally, but theologically. Because again, how can you possibly get around that? Oh, Jehovah chose an individual accused of child sexual abuse. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, Freddie Ray is saying uh, the Blue Envelope channel did a video on Jarrett's about a year ago. Um, I haven't watched that video. Uh, apologies if I'm repeating anything that's in that video. I somehow doubt that I am repeating what's in that video. Clearly, there was something uh, circulating around Ted Jarrett's in order for Mark O'Donnell to ask that question because I, I, if I'd have been there I would not have thought of asking that question because I didn't know at that point that there was any uh, rumour any concrete rumour uh, of uh, well, any rumour of any kind surrounding an actual governing body member um, so I put this live stream out there without knowing everything that's been said about Ted Jarrett. I did do a quick Google search before I came on and I couldn't see anything sort of immediately coming up, documenting things in anywhere near the detail I've just gone into. Um, there we go. Uh, Tamar Jane, Jane says the blue envelope didn't mention him being named on the ARC database. Okay, so it, it's... It's new information that I'm giving you. And again, this is absolutely not about deflecting. You can say that as much as you like. I am just done with sitting on this. And again, I'm, I, I've am i lost all of my reasons. I've, I've lost all of my reasons to sit on it. I'm, I'm no longer working with the, the people I've mentioned. And I no longer have a company to protect and I no longer have drama to avoid. Because I, I tried the whole avoiding drama thing and it, it didn't work. That's not to say that I'm going to be all about drama from now on. It's, it's just that uh, I no longer have the same fear of, of mentioning names that, of people that I've worked with as I would have had only only a few days ago. That's just how it is. And and thank you also to the makers of the Hillsong, the Secrets of Hillsong, specifically Stacey Lee, who directed and produced, for prompting me to do this. Because that's what really got the, the cogs whirring. Uh, Gail Smith says, Lloyd, shedding light on this is the right thing to do. Good on you for your continued courage. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, I... Again, I, I'm not interested in doing anything with this now. I mean, if, if things happen as a result of sharing this, uh, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I, I won't write off covering it here on JW Watch, um, but I, I kind of want other people to to deal with this now. Uh, I, I, I would love um, a proper investigative journalist to see how deep this goes and to get their hands on actual concrete evidence because um, I think that when we're talking about something as huge as the Jehovah's Witness cover-up of child sexual abuse, motives are important. You know, it's good to 
know the policies. It's good to know about the lawsuits. All of that is very, very important to talk about. Um, but if you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, and, or if you're reasoning about this in your mind as a Jehovah's Witness, you're going to be thinking, yeah, but, you know, why would they? You know, why would they cover up child abuse? It's so clearly wrong. It's so clearly an unchristian thing to do to a child. Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it does make sense if it turns out that the leadership have been alleged to have been involved in at least one instance. So I've been talking now for one hour, uh, seven minutes or so, or, or maybe slightly less. Um, Beauty Rest says, it hurts me so much that you guys just split up like that. Yeah, it, it was a very, very hurtful thing. Um, but it happened. And uh, yeah, nothing, nothing I can do about it now. Uh, Melanie Brueggemann says, from an outsider's perspective, I truly appreciate Mark O'Donnell, Javier Ortiz and you. I can see everyone's point of view too, but I really appreciate all of you and wish things were like they used to be. Thank you, Melanie. Um, yeah, again, I'm not uh, naming and shaming here either James Pender or Mark O'Donnell or Javier Ortiz, but those three individuals in particular know stuff. And I, th I think... Um, I don't think that this sort of thing should be sat on for for any reason because that's how that's how abuse gets covered up. That's how Frank Houston um, of the Assemblies of God, that's how he got away with stuff for so long is because people, individuals knew stuff, but no one talked to each other and it just got buried. Um, and I will just say this before I sign off. Um, Kim Silvio has said an awful lot about me including things that are not true and things that have clearly been designed to destroy me she is fixated on details about my private life and about my relationships and about my business but to my knowledge I don't think she's mentioned this once I'm happy to be proven wrong Um and if she has mentioned it, why has it not been mentioned with the same furore and the same intensity and the same enthusiasm as the enthusiasm with which she's waged her hate campaign against me? How How, how is... How am I failings real or imagined as a human being anything anything compared to this compared to a record of a governing body member that indicates that he was alleged to have abused a child how, how are they even anyway <laughs> i wanted to add that on the end um, and I wanted as well to read more comments, but I guess it's better for this video to be as, as brief as it possibly can be. Um, and I've kind of said everything that I want to say, and also it's proven harder to do this than I thought it would be. And yeah, I, I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you for watching, and yeah, take care.